Mindless Can, the podcast, with radio personality Jane Lindley Thomas and psychologist Paul Bushell. Because every act of kindness, no matter how big or small, can change lives. In this series, Jane and Paul hope to enrich your life by giving you practical tools on how to be kinder in your relationships with yourself, with those around you, at home, work, and in your community. Welcome to this week's episode in the Kindness Can podcast series. Gosh, we've missed you. I know. Hi, Jane. Hello, my love. How's it? Yeah, it's always so, so nice to connect with you. And we're kind of getting used to, I think, molding in was a word that you and I used earlier this week, molding into kind of new routines. And this is one of them. Absolutely. I really wanted to hold space in this episode for teachers because I think, you know, a lot of my commentary around the stresses that I, I'm faced with daily is, you know, homeschooling my three beautiful children, not all the time beautiful, sometimes terrorists and challenging, uh, but my life's greatest work and really having a bit of a bitch and gripe about workload or I don't know, whatever it's got to do with homeschooling has definitely been a, a theme of constant checking in with, right? Yeah, I think it's been a very tough adjustment for parents, especially parents as they start to go back to school. In the early stage, it was the adjustment of trying to understand the technology. That was a whole thing. Uh, And then trying to kind of stick to that routine, trying to hold on to that consistency. But that's kind of hard because kids push back and they fight it. And you reach a point where you kind of like, well, isn't it just easier when they are smiling and laughing? And then we all started kind of making a plan and trying to go back to work and find opportunities within this and adjust to that. And so our time to do homeschooling became compromised by that. And so all the chapters of of the homeschooling are unfolding and and each one certainly has come with its own challenges. In the last uh, week, I'd say, I've chatted to more and more teachers because it kind of just dawned on me, uh, in particular, a friend of mine who is uh, a young mom, She's got two young kids and she was just saying there is such a, um, it's such a challenge for her as a teacher because she's battling to even get around, she's, she's battling to get around teaching her own children because yeah. she's so focused on getting her class from A to B in this new format of technology that her kids are kind of falling by the wayside and you don't stop being a mother at home, but now you're mothering and you're getting drilled out there as well because you've got parents that are asking you questions almost 24 seven because of the fear that's driving it. So it's not business as usual. Um, And she just, she looked like she'd been, you know, through a couple of rounds of Mike Tyson. Sure. Well, I think there's a whole book that teachers could write on of what their experience of this has been and all the chapters that they've had to face as they go, yeah, have had to kind of take their whole curriculum and their whole way of doing stuff online And I think for the record, we need to say it loud and clearly that it it has not been an easy journey for teachers. And by no means is it any easier right now. They are not coasting at home. I think there's so many aspects to this experience which continue to make it very challenging to them as teachers, the ability to do their job, but as parents, as individuals, as partners. Schools are so often the center of our communities. They hold so much together. And as much as this national lockdown and COVID-19 has blown every industry out of the water, schools have been blown out with it. And they're really, really working so hard at the moment to try to continue to be that consistent, that centerpiece of our community. But boy, I don't think it's been without challenges. I think what makes it also difficult is that, you know, you're trying to cater for the child that is strong. And then you're trying to cater for the child that's not as strong. So there's the child at the end of the week that says, you know, I didn't actually find that week challenging and I actually need more work. And there are kids that are saying that. Yes. Or there's the kid that's just so overwhelmed and the anxiety that comes with trying to get from task to task just to have a sense of achievement. And then the parents being shown up how it feels by other parents because the tasks are being submitted and the tests are being done. And you're just like, whoa, it took us half the morning to read a comprehension. (laughs) I think we've spoken about this before, how when the familiar is taken away from us, a lot of our usual and normal coping strategies, our ways of balancing out 
the light and the dark of a day are, are also taken away with that. So if you imagine for a teacher, when you're standing in front of a classroom over how, however many years of training and experience, you learn how to balance out the weaknesses and strengths of different learners, the pushback, the highs and the lows of, of when energies peak and trough in a day, kids who are bullying, all those things. You, you learn how to manage all of that. Now, all of a sudden, you take that online and a lot of those resources have to shift and change also. And I think that's required a lot of adjusting from educators and parents to kind of meet all of those different needs. And that's not easy. It's not easy. And I mean, as a parent, half of me is so desperate for my kids to get back to school. And then the other half, you know, obviously hearing that uh, grade 12 and grade seven and the whole kind of layering of uh, people going back to school, (sighs) then you think, my gosh, how am I going to feel about sending my children back to school? Because going into winter and you're going to get colds and how they're going to social distance and how's that experience going to be in a classroom? I just feel like I wish I could just put a line through 2020 and just say <laughs> revert to 2021. Reset. Reset. And I think that dilemma as a parent, you can imagine how that, that dilemma also sits for an educator, let alone the of decision course. makers in a school. Because so I've got to go back into that space and expose myself to a whole bunch of families again. But at the same time, I can't wait to be with my kids. So many teachers who I'm talking to keep saying the same thing. I just miss the children. I miss their smiles. I miss their engagement. It's what gave me joy in my life. And that's kind of been taken away from me. So I know there's so many teachers who are desperate to go back and being there to hold space for the children in their lives. But they also have this moral dilemma around their own physical health. But also imagine if I were to give it to children and kind of all of that stuff. So it's just such a tough decision to to make. I, I read a post yesterday from a parent just saying, you know what, everyone, this is a personal decision. So if I choose to send my kids back or I choose to keep my kids at home, please respect the criteria that I've gone through and the values that I've used to make that decision. And and I'll do the same for you. And I think that's really important right now. Yeah, I mean, I saw an open letter from a mum who wrote it actually from the viewpoint that so children, I mean, can't necessarily get COVID but can carry it. So what does that mean when you fit a classroom full of carriers and put the teacher in the middle? Um, And she was writing it from the, I don't think this is fair on the teacher. Like who are we to endanger the teacher kind of thing? Yeah. And then you read comments coming in about that conversation that you were just mentioning, uh, whatever your choice is, whether or not you're going to let your children integrate back into the infrastructure of education as far as going into a classroom. But if you don't, then you must be, (laughs) You must be warned that your child won't have a place next year. I mean, that was a whammy, right? Boom. (laughs) Boom shakalaka. We cannot cannot hold your child's place. If you choose not to bring your child back to school, that's your Ndaba. You need to register with the homeschool system and get that sorted out. And then you're like, but then what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then what happens? The fear. Yeah. And we've got to start to fan the fear. the fear. The fear completely makes sense because there's so many parts of this that are so physically, emotionally, developmentally scary uh, from all the stakeholders involved in this conversation. So from whatever angle you're coming from, my advice would be sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and start making a few lists. And, And when I say lists, it's kind of, it's working out what are the things that I'm afraid of and listing them and then trying to understand how genuine those fears are, okay? So you know, where do those fears come from? What are they backed up by? What is the evidence in this situation? And be, be blunt with yourself. Then make another column of what could I do to minimize or mitigate those risks? How could I keep myself safe if I were to still go ahead with this? The fourth column then would be something along the lines of what, what would I lose if I didn't go ahead with this? What are the risks of not going ahead uh, in spite of this fear? And kind of mapping that picture out for yourself and then weighing them up against each other. So kind of like, yeah, these things are what I'm afraid of. This is how serious they are on a scale of one to 10. This is what I could do to try prevent or minimize them. And these are the things that I would lose out on if I didn't go ahead with this. And then you kind of get a clearer picture for yourself of where you're at. And and you kind of use that as your own personal guideline. And then you take that, of course, to people in your life who you trust 
uh, and you share that conversation with it, you bounce it off them. And that includes personal people who you trust, but also professional people who you trust who can input some hard facts into that, including the schools, because we have to trust schools that they are not going to do anything to put our children in intentional risk or danger. Well, no guessing who I'm going to be bouncing my list between. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait to see it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm putting my but, hand you know, up. I mean, again, no, your hand's up in my mind anyway. But um, thank you. Um, but if I'm thinking about it, I mean, younger grades, August, September, that's what they say. Uh, half of me is just like, well, we've done, we've come this far. I mean, I used to be the mom that at the end of a Sunday evening, I put my kids to bed and be like, I'm ready for school tomorrow, hey? To wave those precious little faces. Adios, amigos. See you at home time. <laughs> and we're sitting on day 50, what? <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. want to say to each and every mother that never thought you could get through a weekend or a half-term holiday, look how well you've done. Yeah. Look how well you've done in spite of dropping brightly colored juggling balls onto the floor time and time again, you, you get up and you juggle again and you Absolutely. juggle again. Absolutely. And the same breath to all those teachers who in an incredibly short amount of time, you know, they use their school holidays. So many schools and teachers in a short amount of time were able to take so much of their wisdom and knowledge and make it, make it accessible. And I think that that's a wonderful achievement. I think all of us, as different stakeholders around the young people in our life can be incredibly proud of how much we've managed to hold together in this moment because we're here, we're still going. And I think that's a credit to, to all of us. And that's not to say that although there are lots of advantages to homeschooling and to online learning, that so many of those advantages to being part of a school community and going in every day and, and participating with other adults and other young people in your life uh, don't still also matter. It's about just working out when reintroducing the timing of that uh, feels best. Mm. I mean, if someone had said to me last year, you will spend 50 whatever days at home in your property, I'd be like, yeah, well, whatever. I could never do that. I could never, ever, ever, ever do that. Yeah. So I was, I was reading, uh, it's a philosopher, reading about how these moments are sometimes referred to as black swan moments in that you can imagine when people who had never seen a black swan before suddenly were confronted by one, their whole world was turned upside down. It's kind of like your brain gets taken into a space that it, it never thought possible. And that takes a whole lot of cognitive, emotional, and practical adjustment that, wow, this can exist. And if ever there were a black swan moment, this is it before starting the recording, you know, Jen, you and I were talking about how, you know, we see those images of World War II or, or the Holocaust and how unimaginable they were, but we've kind of learned how to integrate them into our worldview and the fact that they are possible and we've able to adjust the world and our behavior around that. This COVID-19 and the national lockdown is a similar moment, except there's it's so invisible that we can't see broken buildings all around us. We can't see those haunting images, but it's had a very, very similar effect on the world. Uh, and mm. so all of us, whether that's parents uh, or educators and schools, business people, community members, individuals, we all have to continue to be gentle and supportive of ourselves and one another as we readjust uh, and pick up the pieces of this very destructive and hard moment. Yeah, we're well, just going back to doing a grocery shop this morning. What used to be a very jarring visual was seeing people behind masks. I don't even see the masks anymore. Yeah, yeah. I don't even see the masks anymore. It is bizarre to me. Seeing my children in masks is less jarring now as well, just because I see other children in masks, and they see me in a mask, and I see their mom and dad in a mask. We're all in a mask. Testament, I suppose, to our ability to adapt and survive mm. and, and normalize certain things. Uh, and that can be incredibly healthy. But at the same time, we know that there is such a thing as negative resilience, where we can start to adapt and accept certain things which shouldn't be permanent. Uh, and that, I think, includes things from the old normal. Uh, I think we need to let go of some of the negative resilience that we had developed in that old world. Uh, and not go back to them. 
the same time in this adjustment, we need to be careful and conscious of what we do want to take from this moment and what also could just be temporary ways of coping in this moment. Yeah, even me running this morning, I found a mask uh, and it's quite funny, actually. It's like a speedo. So it's like wearing a speedo on my head, but kind of I can run the whole way with it and it's comfortable. And I was kind of like, when I got back from my run, I was like, I feel irritated with myself (laughs) that it's feeling normal and comfortable because I don't want, as much as I see the value of the mask in the here and now, I really, really hope that it's not part of our future forever. Absolutely. So I I kind of wanted, you know, on on the note of, sorry to cut you off, Jane, but kind of kindness can is all about kindness. And I feel like this conversation is kind of just gravitating back towards what is in so many situations, if not all situations, such sage advice. Find ways to be kind to yourself. Find ways to be kind to educators and schools and parents and our kids as we navigate this. And that's, that's the best we can do. Mm. And as always, it starts with kindness to self. I mm. mean, someone said to me the other day, that heard me um, on East Coast Gold. And I said, what was I speaking about? And he said, you said that what helps you is not looking from day to day, but just micromanaging moments to moments. And that's really helped me align myself and actually be more present in my day and not so scattered because I can't control my day to day. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Moments you wake up, you know, some moments you wake up resilient and positive and buoyant and bouncy. And by lunchtime, you're defeated and deflated and, demoralized and depressed but by tea time you're up and you're positive and you're you know yeah. it's like this up and down up and down you can't you can't sum up your experience in these long lengths of time not for me anyway no and i think that's great advice jane because this is the process of remolding and that remolding means trying to find ways to take things that worked from the past into the present taking things that I've learned through this experience into the present. But that's a process of remolding here. And I think emotionally, it's quite exhausting. So that regular checking in with yourself, okay, okay, what am I feeling now? Where am I at now? Okay, what is that feeling? How can I help myself with it? That kind of kind attitude towards ourselves is very, very important. Well, I do love looking at your face, although I would love to be sitting next to you uh, side by side, heart to heart, eye to eye, but I'll take your beautiful face on a computer screen for, for now. And yeah, I can't wait for that day where we can be back in studio recording face to face. But as always, a joy to be with you, Jane. Oh, my love. If you'd like to catch up with Paul and I and find out about uh, the work that we do for virtual online classrooms, as well as uh, workspaces, Uh, please connect with us. We love hearing from you. Info at kindnesscan.co.za as well as www.kindnesscan.co.za. I love, treasure, and adore you. We'll chat so soon. You've been listening to Kindness Can, the podcast. Find out more at kindnesscan.co.za.